afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jim Pillsbury, and we are doing our League, uh, Framingham League of Women Voters Informed Framingham event, our first one of the summer of 2020. Today, we are talking about ballot question one, which is the right to repair question on your ballot. And today, we have uh, Tommy Hickey, the director of Right to Repair Coalition, and a Kate. Katrina, Katrina Gates from Safe and Secure Data, uh, representing the other side. We're going to hear from Tommy first, and then Katrina, and then we have uh, a bunch of questions that have already uh, come into us. Uh, that uh, hopefully we can have everybody uh, have those guys answer those questions. So, Tommy, if you would mind, uh, take it away in the beginning, and uh, you have up to ten minutes. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Tommy Hickey. I'm the director of the Right to Repair Coalition. We are a coalition of 1,500 independent repair shops here in Massachusetts. We represent the 30,000 aftermarket jobs also here in Massachusetts. Uh, we are responsible for the 2012 Right to Repair law that passed at 86%. It is the highest passing ballot initiative in, in Massachusetts history. We joke around, you can't get nine out of 10 people to agree on anything. But when it came to their car repair choice, uh, Massachusetts spoke. Um, so what happened when we passed that law is we mandated that car manufacturers give independent repair shops the same information they give to dealerships as to create a level playing field so that people could go to their local shop and get their cars fixed. What was happening is that car manufacturers were giving dealerships better, more efficient information to dealerships, and people were having to go to independent repair shops or being sent to dealerships and having to double pay and double visits to get their car fixed. So we passed that law, and for the last six years, the law has worked great. There's been a level playing field. People have gotten their cars fixed just fine. There was a car vote in the 2012 law for us remote diagnostics. It's also known as telematics. And telematics is in now, in, in 2020, in 90% of new vehicles. And what it is, it's a wireless system for diagnostics. So right now, when you go to get your car fixed, they plug into this OBD port. The OBD port tells you what's wrong with your car, and then you get your car repaired. Now, that is all done wirelessly. 90% of new cars do that now, and that is not in the 2012 law. So what this law does, a yes on one, closes that loophole for this new wireless communications. What, ballot, what, what question one does is it mandates the car manufacturers give the car owner of the car direct access to the remote diagnostics. That's information necessary to diagnose, maintain, and repair the car. That is not GPS location. That is not personal information. Again, just information necessary to diagnose, maintain, and repair the car as stated in the attorney general summary of the bill. Then with authorization from the owner, you can share that information with an independent repair or a dealership of your choice. This is all about fixing a loophole in the law updating the right to repair law that 86% of Massachusetts voted for. So you can continue to get your car fixed where you want because we believe it's your car. You should get all the information necessary to fix it. Great, Tommy, thank you. Katrina, you're up next. Yeah, thanks Jim. And thank you so much for having us today uh, oh. to talk about this, uh, this very important uh, question here. So um, I know we've been calling this uh, right to repair, but uh, just first and foremost, we, we really don't like to call this right to repair uh, on a fundamental premise. This really is not about repairing vehicles. This question is about uh, data and data access. Um, so right to repair is settled law in Massachusetts. And actually Tommy said in his introduction that the law has worked great and people can get their cars uh, wherever they want, uh, whether that be an independent repair shop, a dealer or any other location. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're talking about the, this loophole that doesn't exist. So on one hand, you know, we're saying that, that the law works fine, that there's a loophole. Um, so this question, it works very well. It uh, protects and ensures that consumers can get their vehicles repaired at whatever repair shop they want. And what question one does is it goes much further than this existing law. And question one would enable anyone, any third party to access your vehicle data 
whenever they want from wherever they want. And it wouldn't just be when your car is in a shop, you know, it would really be when someone is sitting at home on a laptop. Um, and this actually includes sensitive information like real-time GPS location data. And that's, that's why this question is really all about information. Um, and so actually, you know, voting no on question one would really protect right to repair because it will, uh, you know, it'll really continue to ensure that you can get your car repaired wherever you want without serious security and safety risks that will undoubtedly arise should this uh, new proposal pass. Um, and one other important detail that I just want to bring up is that um, the, the language was written incredibly uh, broad and vague here. So um, it's not just about uh, repair and mechanical data. It was specifically put in um, and written with the words related to. Um, so you can really argue that anything is related to uh, this type of data. So uh, that does include sensitive GPS location behavior patterns. Um, so we're, we're, we would encourage everyone to vote no on, on question one here. Uh, Katrina, do you have slides that, uh, that you'd like to show or no? Um, yes, Jim, I, we, we do have slides, which we're happy to, uh, uh, I believe we sent over. Are you uh, pulling those up? Perfect. Slides are up on the screen. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, so just going through here, some of the implications of the proposal. Um, you can read, you know, some of the most serious ones here. I, I just walked through most of these. Um, but on the next slide, what, one thing that we would really like to highlight is uh, that this question was already brought up in California about six years ago in, in 2014. Um, and it was struck down in California for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is the opposition that it received from groups like the NAACP, the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault and uh, Domestic Violence and other public safety groups. Um, and this, that, this was actually a, a less expansive proposal than the one that we see here in Massachusetts today. And then on the next slide, what we have is, um, so this is actually the, the part of the Massachusetts general law that covers telematics. So uh, the proponents of this question like to say that there's a loophole that telematics has been carved out of existing law. Um, and what you can see here in the first line is that where uh, telematics information is exclusively provided uh, for repair information, it has to also be made available to independent repair shops. And that's it? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so let's, can we do a few questions? And um, Tommy, you want to um, say anything else to that or no? Uh, sure. I mean, if you want me to, to rebut some of those points and then, you know, she, she can come back and we can get some questions. I, however, however you want to do this, I, I would like to rebut some of those points. Fine. Fine. Go ahead. Um, so the car manufacturers love to say that this is not right to repair, um, when indeed the Secretary of State and the Eternal Gen Attorney General have labeled this, and as you will see when you go vote on November 3rd, or if you do a mail-in ballot, it is titled an act to update and enhance the 2013 right to repair law, because that's what this is. This is an amendment to the 2013 right to repair law to allow new technology that the car manufacturers are using to bypass independent repair shops and their owners. So. That's one point. Um, they say this is already covered under the law. I find it interesting that Section D actually takes away any telematic information to independent repair shops or owners. It actually says under their highlighted section, nothing in this section shall have to do with telematics, remote diagnostics, or mobile communications derived from a vehicle. And that's why we're here today. If this bill passed right now, and this was already in the 2013 right to repair law, we would get all wireless information, there would be no change. They are fighting against this because right now they're moving into wireless communications, not covered under the law. And they're allowed to create a monopoly and give the dealerships all their repair information. People have less choice and it'll cost more. Um, they talk about a California piece of legislation, which was a dangerous piece of legislation that had to do with real time uh, GPS location, had to do with um, third parties. That is not this piece of legislation, in fact, the car manufacturers never talk about our piece of legislation. Our bill, and again, I, I urge people to look at the language of the bill. I urge you to look at the Attorney General's summary of this bill. 
This is mechanical information and mechanical information. And this is the attorney general summary necessary to diagnose, maintain and repair the car. That is not GPS location. That is not personal information. That's what car manufacturers are collecting. This is everything to get your car fixed. And this goes directly to the owner of the car. There's no third parties getting this unless the owner of the car wants to share it with an independent repairer of their choice. This is about empowering the consumer who bought the car to get the information necessary to fix it and share that information with their local shop that they've been going to for 20, 30 years, sometimes even more. So that's my rebuttals for that. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, I, um, Katrina, could you could you just um, give us a, a synopsis of the um, the commercial that says that uh, from the uh, National Transportation Agency that says uh, that people can um, hack into a moving car um, and disable the car? Does that um, does that can you comment on that? Because that's a pretty scary, um, it's a pretty scary commercial uh, from where I sit. And I, I'm sure other people would find that very disturbing uh, that anybody could do that. Um, Katrina, could you uh, comment on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Jim. Um, and it, you're, you're right, it is scary. Uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, wrote a, a, a letter to about the Massachusetts proposal, specifically question one here. Um, and they wrote a letter warning of the serious cybersecurity and safety risks that are proposed by this ballot question. Um, and they say that you know, a malicious actor, that another entity uh, could actually take control of a car and not just access the information like this location data that we're talking about, but they could actually take control of vehicles if question one passes. And um, what's really important to note is that this is not just uh, talking about consumer vehicles. You know, this, this goes up to heavy duty trucks. So thinking about, you know, a, a foreign actor, um, hackers, criminals being able to actually take over vehicles of, of that size and, and inflict serious um, damage, it is, it's, it's very concerning. And, and this is taking, um, this has gained the attention of groups again, like the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So let me ask, um, what's the difference between uh, the cars that are equipped with NSTAR in this, in this uh, particular language of this? People, NSTAR, from what I understand, can uh, you know, beam into the car, shut it off uh, if the police are chasing it, if it's stolen. Is, does this, uh, is this the same thing that we're talking that you're talking about here the the transference of data is is a that that is kind of what we're talking about that's a practical example of this type of data transference um but this is you know this is that is not access um to the car's computer so you're you're not actually giving individuals um open access to the the telematic or to the information within a vehicle Okay. All right. Um, Tommy, can you, can you address that for me, please? Uh, the NSTAR question has come up uh, where they can um, actually uh, turn off a car if it's being chased by the police or if it was stolen or something happened. Um, so could that, you comment on that? So that would be a, a car manufacturer's question. Uh, I believe Ford owns NSTAR. Um, so that is a system that we want, we have no access to, and we want no access to. Oh, okay. Our, our coalition okay. fixes cars for a living. Um, car manufacturers sell cars and, and build cars. So, um, that has, that has nothing to do with us. We want, we want no, um, information from the OnStar system. Okay. Um, is the language, uh, the same as what it was in that did not pass in California? Absolutely not. It's actually way shallow down into, like I said, information to diagnose, maintain, and repair the car. The California okay. bill is much, much broader in scope. Okay. Um, I'm sure you're, you've seen the commercials um, for uh, the young woman wa walking to her car and um, somebody behind her, it, you know, whatever uh, your mind could come up with. Um, the domestic violence and the certainly Jane Doe 
uh, organization uh, dealing with domestic violence uh, and others organizations oppose this bill. Um, are you saying that they are wrong in this and what they're uh, claiming to be? Well, domestic violence is a very serious issue. Um, and I think, I, I think they're misinformed. Um, in fact, reading the Jane Doe uh, testimony to the Consumer Protection Committee was about geolocation. Um, and they probably have gotten that from the car manufacturers who continue to uh, steer lies about GPS location of personal information. Again, I urge people to look at the language, the proof is in the pudding. This is about diagnostic repair and maintenance information for your car. The OBD port is moving wireless. And that's all we're trying to do is to make sure that the people in your neighborhood, your local community guys that you trust can fix your cars now and in the future. Mm -hmm. Katrina, could you uh, chime in on this aspect of it, please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one thing that I would like to note is that the um, the two primary funders of, of question one on the, the proponent sign, um, they are, excuse me, um, so they've actually been going around to various different trade organizations uh, over the past year showing how they want this application system to work. And it includes uh, information like maps and location data. So I think to say that that this would be something that they, they don't want access to or aren't looking for is, is completely false here. Um, and for example, I actually, I have a slide that I, I can pull up here um, from one of the, from one of the trade shows, uh, let's see here, just to show this location data, if that's okay, Jim. Michael, can she do that? Yeah, she should be able to. Okay. Yeah, it says screen sharing is off. Is somebody able to enable me? I'd be happy to pull it up. Okay, so yeah. this here is from a, a car show in 2019. Um, that you can see. So, it, you know, this is from um, the Auto Care Association, who's one of the primary funders of this question. And what you can see here um, on the next slide is a map with various different locations here. Um, so you have here diagnostics, location, driving behavior in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. And then similarly here. So I uh, just want to uh, just to say that this isn't something that the proponents of this question are looking for or want access to is, is, uh, is just false. Okay. Um, when, uh, when does this take effect if it were to pass, Tommy? It would be model year 2022. 2022. Every car that is every year, model year before that, it doesn't apply. Correct. And it and it can't be retrofitted or or modified or it, it could whatever. I mean, understand that this is a new technology that we haven't even been able to access now. So the market will figure itself out in terms of retrofitting to cars. I can tell you that this year, 2020, 90% of new cars have this technology. So if you're driving a, a 2020 there is the capabilities of remote diagnostics in your car right now that car manufacturers are collecting. Okay. Um, go ahead, Katrina. Yeah, and there are two things there. Um, so one is that for model year 2022, uh, that, that's incredibly dangerous in and of itself, just because uh, as probably many of you know, model year 2022 cars are going to be coming out sometime in 2021. Um, so to have to create and develop and, and actually actualize this complex system that requires, a, you know, an incredible amount of cybersecurity and and all that um, in such a short period of time. I don't even know how that would be possible. Um, and then two is that, you know, again, all of these cars, you know, whether they have telematics or not, they they are um, able to be accessed through this onboard diagnostics port. Um, so again, you can still bring your car to a local repair shop or any repair shop of your of your choosing. Um, so just because they're equipped with a, a, a telematic system does not mean that um, they aren't able to be repaired in other ways. And, and the, yeah. Okay, uh, for Tommy, this question uh, from a viewer, um, do you think, why do you think it is important to prevent local mechanics from being able to work on my car? 
shouldn't I have the right to go wherever I choose for auto repairs? I I'm believe sorry, that, that that's for Katrina. Yeah. Yeah, it is for Katrina. Thank you very much. Katrina. Um, I have a very simple answer to that, which is yes. Um, you, sh you should be able to go wherever you want to repair your car. You can, and you will into the future. Okay. Tommy, so you agree with... Sorry, Jim. That That's protected under existing law. Oh, okay. Right. Tommy, you have a comment about that? Uh, well, I, I absolutely think you should be able to get your car fixed where you want. Uh, that's, that's what this question does. Um, mm -hmm. We're moving to a wireless society. Uh, the car manufacturers in 2012 knew they were moving to wireless society, wireless cars, wireless communications. And this was carved out of the law for a reason. This is all about profits. The car manufacturers have a monetary interest in holding on to this information and giving that information to their dealerships or whoever pays them, pays them the most to, to have this information. And mm -hmm. a vote yes on this would give the owner direct access to this information and allow them to give that information to who they want, their independent repair or dealer. If, you're, if you go to get your car fixed to the dealership, this does not stop. All this does is empower you to get the information derived from your car. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this, Tommy. Uh, the auto part stores, just the stores themselves, they would, um, they would have the equipment to be able to interface with anybody's car and yeah. diagnose diagnose what's wrong with the, the car or no? No, the, the auto parts stores, like I said, there's 30,000 aftermarket jobs here in Massachusetts. It's a, it's a whole competitive business. So the aftermarket gives independent repar repair shops parts to fix cars. There's your OEM parts and then there's the um, aftermarket parts. So your mm -hmm. auto zones, a lot of your do it yourselfers, you're buying parts and you distribute them to independent repair shops and warehouses. But what this would do is give the owner of the car that information so they can share with independent repair of their choice. This wouldn't go directly to any third party. This would go to the owner of the car. Okay, so when I bring my car to AutoZone, they plug in a, a machine that reads the codes. That's what, that is something wrong with my car, correct? That's I, I not gonna change? I believe independent repair shops, I'm not sure how many AutoZones are, are, are plugging into the OBD port, um, but, understand the OBD port is turning wireless. So they can, yeah. they can plug into the OBD port today, but tomorrow will they be able to? And, that, and that's, that's really the issue at hand. Okay, so if, they, if, they, if we approve the ballot question, they'll be able to do that, plug in wirelessly, correct? And if they don't, if we don't approve the ballot question, it stays the same. They can still plug in their diagnostic machine into, their, into the car's port and tell you what's wrong with the car? Well, there's been there's been countless studies that the OBD port is on the way out. And, and having more said that, this is a new technology. There is now a more efficient way, a more dynamic way to diagnose a car. Remember what 2012 was all about. 2012 was about a level playing field between the dealerships and independent repair shops. And now a new technology, a great technology, telematics has come across. And dealerships and car manufacturers are the only ones who have access to it. Independent repair shops, we as a coalition, we fix cars for a living. If there is a more efficient, comprehensive way of fixing a car, we need a level playing field. This is a competitive market. And we know that owners want to go to independent repair shops. 76% of the time, consumers of cars want to get their cars fixed at local shops because they're a part of the community and they're cheaper and they're more convenient. And without this, Jim, without this, dealerships would have a monopoly. You could only get your car fixed at car manufacturer approved shops, which are dealerships. Yep. Um, let me ask uh, both of you this uh, question just came in. Hackers seem to be able to hack everything. So what prevents them from hacking this info? What protections are in place to prevent this? So this legislation calls on the car manufacturers to create an open, secure, and standardized platform. They collect this information right now. So they clearly have safeguards or are keeping this information safer, or, or I hope they are. And there have been a number of cybersecurity experts that have echoed the sentiment this can be done in a safe and secure way. Uh, former Boston Police Commissioner Ed Davis, uh, Mike Brown, who was the head of cybersecurity for the Navy, Bruce Schneier, who teaches cybersecurity at Harvard and MIT. There's been a number of reports that say this can be done in a safe and secure way. But what happened is the car manufacturers created a closed system. They wanted to keep this information to themselves to their profit. And all we're saying is that information go to the owner of the car. There's no reason that the owner of the car who bought the car shouldn't get all the information necessary to fix it. I get you. Katrina? 
Um, yeah, absolutely. So the, the question, for, first of all, does not, not say secure. Um, so I do just want to highlight that. And also, um, like you said, that this would create a, a single platform in which that collects all of the car data um, for all makes, manufacturers, et cetera, in one single spot. So it would allow, you know, it, it would, uh, if, if somebody wanted to hack just one system, they would have access to the vehicle data and, and personal sensitive information of every single car um, here in Massachusetts. Um, I also would just like to note that uh, Ed Davis is is a paid consultant from uh, from the proponents of question one, and you know we've we've similarly had a number of groups that have come out to say that this would cause real cybersecurity uh, threats, and and uh, have filed both testimony in the legislature that's publicly available, and again, I'm just bringing up uh, the the letter of the National Highway uh, Traffic and Safety Administration. Um, and it's even gone so far as, you know, we, we talked to an MIT professor who has advised uh, that cars, you know, stop being sold in Massachusetts if, if it's not. Um, and just on the, on the side of automakers actually spent millions and millions of dollars every year protecting this data and making sure that your personal information stays safe um, and secure. And uh, they actually took the initiative to come together and file a set of privacy principles with the Federal Trade Commission um, that, you know, that, uh, that outline how data can be stored and, and utilized. And um, so, it, it, yes, that, that's, that's what my response to that question. <laughs> One last question. Um, what happens next if the ballot question is approved? So if this is approved, car owners will get all information necessary to diagnose, maintain, and repair their car directly and be able to choose where that repair information goes to a local independent repair shop of their choice or to a dealership. Again, this is all about updating the 2012 rights to repair law that Massachusetts voted 86% in covering new technology. Katrina? Yeah, um, so it, it, it's hard to say what would happen if this question was approved because you know we we've yet to see um, any real you know tangible um, plans or, or proposals from the proponents. Um, but what we can say is that that the personal state, personal information and location data, et cetera, of Massachusetts uh, drivers would become more available um, if you you know the ability to get your car fixed anywhere you choose would not change because that's already protected under existing law today. Um, so, you know, and I, I also just do want to go back and highlight a little bit about uh, the funders that are asking this question and pushing in one, um, so, you know, that, for example, AutoZone, as Tommy was talking about earlier, um, they, they've pushed and donated more than a million dollars um, here in Massachusetts to, to promote this ballot question. And, and these groups are, are national, they're big, they're publicly created groups that are funding this question and, and they really want access to this data. Um, so that, that's what's at risk here uh, with question one. All right. Thank you very much, Katrina. Thank you very much, Tommy. Uh, I hope, ladies and gentlemen, you've uh, learned something here today. Uh, there's um, lots to um, consume about this ballot question, and I hope we answered at least some of the questions here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jim Pillsbury. I'm the co-president of the League of Women Voters here in Framingham. Thank you all for tuning in and connecting to the Zoom. And we are on Facebook Live, as well as AFTV, our local public access channel. Uh, this is our informed Framingham event uh, of uh, ballot question number two, ranked choice voting. And uh, joining us today is Alex Salakis. I hope I've said that correct, Alex. Yeah, you did. Uh, Great. Uh, Policy and Communications Manager for Mass Vote, and we thank you for getting here right at the nick of time, I might add. I'll have to talk to your supervisor about that. Um, but uh, again, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, this will be a just informative uh, session. This won't be a debate. This won't be uh, one side versus the other side. 
uh, the League of Women Voters uh, statewide uh, um, has supported ranked choice voting. So uh, that prohibits us from uh, doing a, another side of this. So uh, it'll just be Alex uh, and I and questions from anyone at home. Uh, you can use the chat uh, feature to write some questions which are, are being monitored and we will ask them uh, of Alex after his um, presentation. So Alex, did I get everything correct uh, so far? Yep, so, so far sounds great. Great, okay, so you can take over uh, whenever you wanna and uh, Michael will, um, Michael Cunningham is directing this as always and uh, he can uh, flip the slides uh, when you're ready. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, I'm happy to get started. Um, I can also just uh, share my screen with the PowerPoint as well, um, whatever's easiest for you guys. Okay. I'll, I'll put um, the slides up for you. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much uh, for introducing me, Jim. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, as you mentioned, um, my name is Alex Lacus. I'm the uh, policy and communications manager at MassVote. And uh, yeah, I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, ranked choice voting today. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, so next slide, please. Awesome. Um, yeah, so just to uh, give you guys a little bit of background information on, on ranked choice voting, if um, you're not all familiar with it, um, you know, the term has been thrown around a lot um, in the past month, especially since the, uh, since, uh, the primary has ended and kind of the general has, has kicked up. But uh, the general premise of ranked choice voting is, is quite simple. Uh, you rank candidates on your ballot um, when you go to vote. Sometimes people like to say that you're voting for multiple candidates or you're voting more than once. Um, that's not the case. Instead, you're um, you know, selecting different candidates. It's still one vote, but it really uh, empowers that one vote. Um, you know, it really lets you have the maximum choice within that one vote. Um, so you know, the one example we like to point to when really highlighting ranked choice voting is the uh, fourth congressional district primary, which just took place, the uh, Democratic primary. Um, and there, there were nine Democratic candidates on the ballot. Uh, the winner only won with uh, approximately 22.4% of the vote. Um, but yeah, they won with quite simply majority support. Um, but under ranked choice voting, that wouldn't be the case. Um, if one candidate in an election like that has more than 50% of the vote, then that's when the election ends. But on the first ballot, if no candidate has more than 50% of the vote, then they keep going. So you have your ballot, you rank those candidates one to nine, um, whichever candidate has the least amount of support overall, um, whoever voted, whoever selected that person first um, has their second choice then counted sort of as their first. Um, you then go to the, if nobody has the majority support at that point, then you eliminate uh, the eighth candidate and whoever ranked that person first then has their second choice count. And this goes on and on and on um, until there is a winner until somebody attains um, majority support. It, it, it sounds kind of complicated, but it's really not. It's like, you know, if, if you order pizza, it's not quite simply whatever flavor has the most votes you consider, okay, well, some people like this, some people like that. Um, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the one metaphor that I like to use. Um, next slide, please. Awesome. Um, yeah, so just some of the uh, pros of ranked choice voting. Um, one of them is that it ensures majority support. Um, you know, we like to talk about that uh, fourth congressional district race that just happened. The winner only had 22% of the vote. Uh, in 2018, there was a contested primary in the third congressional district of Massachusetts. And uh, the, the winner there, Lori Trahan, only had about 21% of the vote. Um, so that's not what we want to see as the normal in Massachusetts, especially in competitive races, you know, the races that don't always happen often uh, and the races that garner a lot of attention. Um, so, you know, the pro of uh, RCV and ensuring majority support is something that's really, really uh, positive about it. Um, another is that it increases electoral competition. Um, you know, 
right now in our state, we really have a two party system as is in place in most of the country. You know, if you're not running as either a Democrat or Republican, you really have no shot at winning. Um, so what ranked choice voting does, it actually encourages third party candidates or non-party candidates um, from running uh, because when somebody goes to vote, they don't have to sort of cast that pragmatic vote, the vote that they view as more realistic. Um, they can vote for, you know, whoever they want to in whatever order they want to. Um, so if they want to sort of rate their ideal candidate first, then they can do that. And then they could pick the more pragmatic candidate second. Um, that's that's a, a great benefit of it. The third is that uh, it increases voter turnout. You know, when you have this increased electoral competition, you get people more engaged, you get people more active. Uh, they want to become more involved in a race. Um, so, you know, higher voter turnout is always a positive uh, in any democratic election. Uh, a fourth positive is that it empowers female and minority candidates. It, it pretty much empowers candidates that don't have as much of a chance now, right? The, the less status quo candidates. Um, and this is proven true across the, case, uh, across the country. Um, you know, our CV is used in differing degrees across the country. Um, but it's used in cities and in the state of Maine. And in those states and cities, uh, we've seen candidates that struggle in the sort of, you know, simple majority process that, that we have. Candidates that typically struggle in, in a state like Massachusetts uh, have a far more likely chance of uh, reaching office in states and cities that practice RCV. Um, and then a final positive of uh, RCV is that it promotes a friendlier political environment. Um, instead of politicians constantly clashing with one another, trying to earn everybody's single selection. Um, the system encourages candidates to reach across the aisle or uh, reach out to more moderate or just other people in general, people that they're not typically reaching out to um, because uh, politicians will think, okay, I might not be the first choice on somebody's ballot, but I might be the second, I might be the third. Um, and that is something that we find is actually really, really positive in uh, cities and uh, the state of Maine where, where this is practiced. It actually encourages a friendlier political environment and uh, you know, it gets people more involved uh, generally. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, can you guys see the next slide? Awesome. Uh, yeah, so, uh, some of the common complaints against our CV. Uh, I really hate these complaints to be frank with you. Um, they really frustrate me. Uh, the most common one we hear is that it's too complicated and uh, I can't stand that one. Uh, you know, that's, that's a complaint that's often, and, and just to sort of clarify the, the opposition on ranked choice voting is, it's kind of weird. Um, it's not necessarily split, split across party lines here in Massachusetts, um, but there are organizations uh, that have really come out against it. And, you know, they're making these arguments like it's too complicated. They are simply arguing it's going to confuse voters. And uh, yeah, that's, that's ludicrous. You know, it, it does sound a little bit complicated on the surface, um, but at its heart, it's, it's a system that's dedicated to a more robust, a more energetic and involving uh, democracy. Um, a second complaint, uh, the second major complaint that we hear is that it's too much work. You know, they're saying, oh, there's nine candidates on the ballot. Uh, you shouldn't have to worry about or, or think about all nine of those candidates. Um, and again, that's absurd, you know? Um, you know you should have this choice uh, in ranked choice voting. If you want to select just one candidate or two candidates, you can. You don't have to worry about the other candidates on the ballot if you don't want to. Um, but what ranked choice voting does is it provides you that chance. You know, it provides you the opportunity to really use the full force and full power of your vote. You know, you can you can really look at the candidates you believe in and idealize, and you can rank them where you want to rank them. And then you could take the candidates, you know, you sort of accept with a shrug and you can rank them where you want to rank them. And then the candidates you dislike immensely, you can rank them where you want to rank them. Um, if you only want to rank one, you can. If you want to rank all of them, you can. Um, so those are some of the, the common complaints that we get, but um, you know, they're, they're pretty easy to push back on. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, so just to kind of talk a little bit now about uh, where is ranked choice voting currently in use? Um, as I sort of mentioned earlier, it's used in the entire state of Maine. Um, that's the only state that practices it statewide. Um, and it has not gone without a uh, challenge there. Um, it was passed in a ballot initiative here or in Maine as, it, as it's being considered here in Massachusetts. Um, but there have been multiple challenges within the legislature. They've tried to push back and say, oh, people can't use this. Uh, there have been legal challenges, uh, which the high court of Maine has continuously said, no, ranked choice voting is actually legal. Um, so even though uh, it's been passed, it hasn't been passed without issue, but it's overcome every issue. Uh, and it's only proven more popular. It's used in every single type of election in Maine, and it's going to be used in the presidential election in Maine this year. And that's big because um, it was introduced only to apply to kind of the, the local elections, the state elections and kind of the congressional and Senate races, not the president. And in Massachusetts, uh, will if it were to pass, it would not apply to presidential races, but it could down the road. Um, and what we're seeing in Maine uh, actually gives us hope that it could one day, um, you know, one step at a time. But, you know, this policy has proven very popular um, in Maine where it is, is fully in use. Um, it's used in various cities across the country as well. Um, two of the more high profile cities that it's used in are uh, San Francisco and Minneapolis. Um, in San Francisco, actually in 2018, uh, the city elected their first African-American female mayor in history. And uh, that was under a ranked choice voting system. Um, so that's a, a really great example of ranked choice voting empowering candidates uh, that don't otherwise uh, get the attention they might in this first past the post system we currently have. Um, and it's also used in Cambridge, you know, uh, which is really cool here in Massachusetts. It's been in use uh, since the 1940s and it's used to elect uh, city councilors um, and school, school board members. Um, and what you get is actually one of the most diverse city councils in the entire state, a uh, city council that really represents the broad array of people that live within its city limits, uh, which is exactly what you want. You know, you want a legislative body that looks like um, the city. That's, that's something that we really believe in. And, um, you know, even though that might be happening slowly but surely here under our current system, uh, ranked choice voting really empowers individuals to, to make that a reality. Um, and right now, let's say, ranked choice voting doesn't pass uh, in about a month. Um, it, will, uh, it, it will be implemented in uh, the cities of Amherst and East Hampton. They've actually passed local resolutions to implement it in their own uh, local elections. Um, and other towns and cities could do that across the state as well. Um, but you know, we hope to see it implemented across the state, but even if it's not, uh, there is interest um, at the local level, at the really local level um, to make this happen. Uh, so that's really encouraging for uh, the future of RCV uh, generally. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just to kind of touch on some final points, uh, what would ranked choice voting uh, mean to Massachusetts? As I kind of uh, just mentioned, um, it would apply to state and federal elections. So that means when you're going to vote for uh, your state representative, your state senator, if you're going to vote for a congressional candidate or a senator, a U.S. senatorial candidate, um, it'll apply to those. Um, it won't apply uh, to some local races like uh, school committee races. Um, uh, it won't apply, obviously, to the presidential one that I just recommend, uh, just mentioned. But it will apply uh, to the vast majority of races, and that could that could really change things. You know, in districts where you often have longtime incumbents that go unchallenged or um, districts that don't often see much competition, uh, ranked choice voting can really empower individuals uh, to run in those districts. It can empower individuals that uh, don't often run, you know, like, like female candidates, like candidates of color, uh, like, you know, candidates that were once that are immigrants, um, you know, really empower those that don't often have uh, the resources or the tools um, to win in our current system. It provides them an opportunity um, and it gets, it gets voters more encouraged. You know, voters are going to want to get more involved when they don't have to 
plug their nose and vote. You know, they can vote for who they want to um, and they can really embrace their voice. Um, so that's my uh, brief presentation. The next slide is uh, just as, you know, thanking you guys and um, opening up to any questions. Oh, great. All right, let me, uh, we got a bunch of questions. I'm gonna just rattle them off here. Uh, does this allow more opportunities for voter fraud? No, no. Okay. I mean, uh, um, you know, voter fraud is, is thrown around a lot these days, uh, especially from the president. And, you know, voter fraud is typically when somebody votes twice. Uh, you know, they take two separate ballots and use them like in two separate states, for example. But yeah. here you've just got your one ballot and you're ranking those candidates in the order that you want to rank them. So uh, it really just kind of empowers your voice. Next question. Uh, does this allow people to vote third party without worrying if they are taking a vote away from another candidate? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so um, let's say there's some senatorial race going on. You know, you've got the Democrats, Republicans, uh, Green Rainbow and Libertarian. Those are the four major parties in our state. Those are the four recognized, the ones that are on the ballot every every year. Um, if you really wanted to rank, uh, rank Green Rainbow number one and Democrat number two, um, then you can. And then what will probably happen is uh, the Green Rainbow Party won't have uh, majority support. They'll probably have the least amount or second least amount of support. So your uh, second choice, the Democrats, will then be counted as your priority choice. Um, so your, your vote's not being wasted. You can, if you more align with like the Green Rainbow Party uh, for whatever reason, then you can, you can rank them first. And if you want to kind of fall back on the Democratic Party, then you can. You're not wasting a vote. You're not having to pick between the lesser of two evils. Um, you're allowed to make the, the decision that you really want to make. Hmm. Um, I have heard that there is less animosity between candidates. Please, expl please explain why this might be true. Yeah, so um, that's one of the great perks of our CV. Um, candidates are appealing to you because they don't only want to be your first rank, um, they want to be your second, they want to be your third, maybe even want to be your fourth, you know? Um, so if they're, they have less of an incentive to push back on each other, um, and they have more of an incentive to appeal to as many people as they can. Uh, our current political environment is not built that way at all. You have toxicity everywhere. You have candidates clawing at each other, appealing to the extremes. Um, and this type of system really pushes back on that uh, and it encourages a more, um, you know, a friendlier political environment. Yep. Primaries are not gonna be eliminated, are they? No, no. Okay. So. Um, you will still get the one party ballot that you normally get. Um, so for example, let's say the, the last primary had ranked choice voting, you, you might get a democratic ballot and then you could rank the candidates in the order you wanna rank them. Uh, so if there are 10 candidates, you rank those one to 10. If there are two, then you just vote the way you vote now. Mm. Uh, in primaries, how does, uh, how does uh, a non, how are non-affiliated voters, voters treated? in primaries? Yeah, so um, the way it works now under our current system is they can pick whatever ballot they want. Um, if they're voting by mail, they can uh, kind of select that in their application. If they go to vote in person, they simply just ask for um, whatever party they want. Um, so they can make that choice and then uh, they can uh, rank those candidates however they like. So the, so do the, part, do the rankings, uh, crossover party lines? In the general, in the general. So in the primary, uh, you've got that one party ballot. Oh, you uh, have so to pick your primary, right. Exactly. Pick your, right, that's right. Yeah, when you go in. I'm a poll worker, I should know that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, a couple other uh, questions, how much time? We got enough time? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, you've already answered how many other states have this in place. Uh, Maine is one of the big ones. Uh, that we hear a lot about. Um, if the ballot passes in November, when would it take effect in Massachusetts? 2022. Um, 2022. So it's actually mandated that it has to take effect in 2022, uh, January 1st, 2022, because what happens a lot of the time is um, a ballot measure passes and the legislature doesn't like it. Um, so they try to push it off as long as they can, uh, right. but it's actually written into the act. It has to go into effect starting January 1st, 2022. 
So um, as, as somebody who worked on a ballot question that was changed by the legislature, do they, does the legislature have the right to change any of this if it's passed? Um, probably. They could probably finagle with it and find something, um, okay. which is frustrating. Um, yeah. But yeah. it will eventually come, the, the, it will eventually come into play. Ask the question okay. Joel asked about the machines and the ballots. Oh, um, is there a, is there any in the technical part of this? The machines don't have to change, do they? The, the uh, actual the machines that count the ballots. I'm not exactly sure um, on the technical side of it. There might need to be some new technology implemented just to. There probably won't pro, probably won't need to be. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure, to be completely honest. Okay. All right. Um, uh, let me, uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, can you choose the same candidate as your first, second, and third choice? Yeah, you, you could. Um, it just, it wouldn't that's game in the system. That's game in the system, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, um, it, it, it wouldn't really, it, it wouldn't do anything. Um, okay. Yeah. If you choose only one candidate on your ballot and, a, and, a, and not a second or third, does your ballot still get counted? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're still voting. Um, if you really just want to pick one candidate, then you can, um, and you're still going to count as voting. It's, it's. You're still going to be voting. You're, you're. Um, it just won't be kind of used to the same degree that other votes will if, if you rank everybody else. Okay. Uh, Massachusetts Fiscal Alliance opposes this, uh, saying it is a complex and confusing process that threatens to reduce voter participation distort election outcomes, increase opportunities for corruption, and lead to unforeseen, difficult to explain results. Wow. What is your response to that? Um, well, they're wrong. Keep it short. <laughs> um, you know, look at the state of Maine. They're a state that have used it for the past couple of years, pushing back on every single challenge, and the people accept it. Um, the people accept it, and it's being expanded to now apply uh, to presidential elections. It, it doesn't leave room for corruption. Sure, it does sound kind of complicated, um, but you know the book War and Peace sounds kind of complicated, but people have read it. Um, you know, if you understand it, uh, it enters into force and it really empowers everybody. It empowers voters. It empowers candidates. Uh, it empowers those that are typically overlooked. Um, so the benefits far outweigh any con of, of confusion. Do you have a sense of, uh, you had mentioned increased uh, voter participation in the places that have adopted it, uh, San Francisco, Cambridge, et cetera. Do you, uh, do you have a sense of if it has truly increased voter participation? Yeah, I mean, I haven't uh, looked at the exact numbers for Cambridge, but Cambridge does traditionally have higher voter turnout. Um, mm -hmm. You know, their turnout yeah. rates can reach I mean, in the primary alone, I think their, their turnout rates were up to like 70%. So uh, they're, they're typically very involved. And I yeah, think they are. Yeah. the fact of RCV really helps that. Yeah. Um, can you, you don't have a sample ballot showing what that would look like, do you? On a Not on me right now. Um, okay. But that might, be that might be interesting for people uh, to uh, see. Yeah, to see that it would uh, it would obviously have to change something. Yeah, no, I mean it really right. it really would the, the ballot you use now it, it would it would be the same ballot you know because you have the the nine candidate well no you wouldn't need the numbers right um, so the ballot would look a little bit different um, right. yeah but you know you're it, it would just be filling it out like you do any other ballot it would just be in a different way. Yep. Just to make sure we're all clear, this is uh, not local elections, not mayor, not council not school committee, but only state and uh, would it be for state and federal offices? Yeah, federal, but not the president. So not uh, the president. Okay. Yeah. So voting for senator, voting for congressional candidate, state rep, state senator, uh, things like that. OK. All right. Great. Um, one last question I think we have time for. I heard that the person with the fewest first choice votes is eliminated from the runoff to see who wins. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, what some cities and towns have now are called runoff elections where the top two candidates go into another race. And then that's how you achieve the majority candidate. Um, what ranked choice voting does is it eliminates the need for that process entirely. Um, so you rank the candidates in whatever order you want. And 
um, the candidates with the least amounts of support are and eliminated we'll until there's a top winner. Um, even if candidates are, you know, quote unquote, eliminated, um, your vote still counts, your support for them is still there. Um, so you're still making the selections that you want to in, in the selections you believe in. Um, do you see confusion among voters when the local ballots are not part of this? So two different systems. Um, I mean, potentially, but I think it'll, I think it'll be solved fairly quickly. You know, they'll see their ballot and the ballots that are used in ranked choice voting look different than they do from the, the regular ballots. So I think they'll understand. And if they have any questions, you know, there'll be loads of information provided by everybody if this comes into effect, you know, organizations will provide it. The secretary of state, secretary will of state yeah. um, so there'll be a big education campaign to help yeah. folks understand how is ranked choice voting going to work here in Massachusetts. Okay. That makes sense. Um, Alex, I think we're going to hold it right there. Um, we've, I answered uh, or asked you all the questions that have been given to us. Uh, yeah, we appreciate like to clarify if I could. Oh, up. Mr. Mr. Uh, Patrick is uh, on screen. We only have yeah. 30 seconds. Just 30 seconds. Clarification. What I was asking for is the actual language of the question that we'll see on the ballot and how. Oh, 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 I see. And then I know I'm familiar with another question we'll talk about next week, but there's a short statement that's legal and then there's a summary. That's what I was looking for. I get you. Okay. Sorry, I misconstrued that. How much uh, will Alex it cost the, the city clerk budget? Oh. All right, uh, two quick, uh, well, I don't know if Alex would know that, Joel, but um, uh, uh, Patrick. This, this is Stephanie, let me just cut in real quick. Joel, he's already said that he's not sure if there's IT requirements to machines, so I don't think he can answer the question about the cost. Um, Alex, if you could just quickly answer if you've got that summary, and if you do, you could send it to us and we could send that out to all others that registered. We have to wrap this up pretty quick. Thank yeah, you. I mean, um, any costs that, uh, come from ranked choice voting, any cost increases are typically aided by the Secretary of State's office. So any cost increases that come with running an election with ranked choice voting, um, you know, the Secretary of State would help out with that. So there would be less of a burden on local communities. Um, but it doesn't seem that there'd be there'd be much of a uh, additional cost because, you know, okay. you're using virtually the same stuff. Alex, uh, thank you very much. Everyone who tuned in, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you in a uh, week from uh, tomorrow on our C, uh, CPA uh, debate. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.